The Yakutia phenomenon or what scientists don't talk about. Let's take a look at this map of the northern hemisphere of the Earth and pay attention to the blue spot in the area of Yakutia. I marked this place on Earth with the blue spot. Called the Pole of Cold, this place, notice, is very far from the geographic North Pole. It's only 63 degrees north latitude. For comparison, the city of St. Petersburg is located at 60 degrees north latitude. The difference is not great, just 327 kilometers. A few words about the uniqueness of Yakutia. Yakutia is the largest region of the Russian Federation. In addition, Yakutia is the largest administrative territorial unit in the world. Yakutia is larger than the three largest Commonwealth of Independent States countries, including Kazakhstan and surpasses Argentina, the eighth largest country in the world by area. However, the population of Yakutia is less than 1 million people, which makes its population density one of the lowest in Russia. Only Chukotsky and Nenets Autonomous Okrugs have a lower population density. Yakutia, also known as the Saka Republic, is a region with significant natural resource and economic potential. The capital city of Yakutia is Yakutsk. In 1933, at the point I indicated on the map, it was registered. The lowest temperature in the northern hemisphere of the Earth since the beginning of the 20th century is minus 67.8 degrees. At the North Pole that year, it was even warmer. That's why, along with several other factors. The Omiakon Valley in Yakutia, it's located at the specified point, is actually the harshest place on the planet where a permanent population lives. You can get an idea of what a Yakutian frost is like from this photograph. Boiling water thrown from a mug instantly turns into mist, snow, and ice. This happens when the air temperature is minus 42 degrees Celsius. One might ask, if this place on Earth is so cold in winter, what makes it so cold? Maybe it's the winds caused by cyclones and anticyclones? It turns out, they have nothing to do with it here. The very fact that in this place, in 1933, the lowest air temperature in the northern hemisphere of the planet since the beginning of the 20th century was recorded, minus 67.8 degrees Celsius, already says a lot. It clearly shows that no winds could have brought the cold here from anywhere and frozen the village. I'm Yakon. If the pole of cold is literally located here, then if the cold does spread by winds, it can only be from here, in different directions across the world. For winds to be able to cool I'm Yakon down to such a temperature, it would have to start from this very place. Somewhere nearby, there must have been an even colder object with, for example, a temperature of minus 70 or more degrees Celsius. But there just isn't any such cold object nearby and the wind strength in Yakutia, in the area of the Pole of Cold, is the weakest. Almost always, there's hardly any wind. According to meteorologists, the average annual wind speed in Yakutsk is 1.8 meters per second. So what exactly is literally sucking the heat out of the land of Yakutia every year to this day? And the most interesting question is, where does the gigantic amount of thermal energy taken from Yakutia go? And where is it released? Maybe there are some underground processes in Yakutia unknown to science that act as heat pumps. The process of extracting heat can be illustrated by the example of a refrigerator. This is when the expansion of gases occurs with the removal of heat. Now let's look at the map of the Russian Federation, where the cold pole is marked in purple, with an air temperature of minus 46 degrees. This is a map of the average monthly temperatures in Russia for the month of January. Below is a map of Russia, where the cold pole is also marked in dark blue and with the number 6. The dotted line shows the boundary of the permafrost distribution. This tells us that Dead Moroz appears in the village of Oymyakon not from the sky as many still think, but he comes to people from underground. Personally, I got the impression that right in front of this village there is a super powerful natural ice generator, or in other words, a heat pump that transfers heat from the surface of the earth and the surrounding air somewhere into the interior of the planet. During the summer, when the sun intensely heats the northern hemisphere of the Earth, the solar radiation emitted by the sun and the warmth do their best to counteract the work of this underground natural heat pump. But still, the map of average annual air temperatures clearly shows the place where exactly this heat collector is located. In Yakutia, it is located there. 
The map of permafrost distribution also shows this. This is what they call the long-term permafrost. Rocks that have been frozen for a long period of time, from several to tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. As we can see on this map, the depth of the permafrost, which is more than 500 meters, indicates the presence of a clearly defined pole of cold in the center of Yakutia. Comments from the reader Mr. Nemo, Anton, here is a link for you on the topic related to your article. Right now in this icy pit, it's minus 51 degrees. I'm answering. The most interesting thing is that, according to this map, which, in addition to winds, cyclones, and anticyclones, shows different temperature zones in different colors, the coldest places are marked in burgundy, and the very coldest places are marked in dark burgundy. In the northern hemisphere of the Earth, there are two ice pits, one in Yakutia and the other in Greenland, where heat from the surrounding area is literally sucked into the ground like in a Weber heat pump. Moreover, these two ice pits, which intensely absorb heat from the surface of the planet, are located almost symmetrically relative to the North Pole and are almost equally distant from it. So how do you explain the presence of these cold poles in Yakutia and Greenland? Gentlemen scientists, associate professors with candidates, what physical phenomenon, which literally acts as a heat pump, are you simply not telling people about in your books? Let's consider an alternative hypothesis about the formation of permafrost and the movement of so-called ancient glaciers. Author Sibet there is a generally accepted scientific explanation that permafrost on the plains of Eurasia and North America formed as a result of soil freezing during the glaciation thousands of years ago. There were supposedly several glaciations. There is no point in listing their periods, since the radiocarbon method is not just inaccurate and has an error margin, it is fundamentally flawed. But scientists like to keep quiet about one detail in the characteristics of permafrost. This is the depth of soil freezing and the thickness of the ice, which are supposedly considered perennially frozen ground. Permafrost in Yakutia reaches up to a thousand meters deep into the ground. Yes, not a single glacier, even with surface temperatures in the winter period of minus 50 to 60 degrees, can freeze the ground to such a depth. Deep underground, the soil always has positive temperatures. Its heat capacity won't allow the permafrost to spread deeper. And when a glacier lies on the surface of the Earth, it actually acts as an insulator. Convective heat doesn't escape, and as we know, heat can only leave through heat transfer. In the table, we can see how conductive each material is. The heat transfer of ice is about the same as that of sandstones. In villages, attic floors and houses are still insulated with clay. Yes, its heat transfer is not like that of wood, but it's not like that of metals either. Let's recall the open subglacial lake in Antarctica. Apparently, there is no permafrost in that place, even though the Antarctic ice has supposedly been there for hundreds of thousands of years. It's possible that there are geothermal vents there. Lake Vostok is warm with a temperature of 10 degrees. Researchers in alternative fields on this topic have long been asking questions and expressing opinions about the mechanism behind the formation of permafrost. Here are some of their ideas. First, a breach of the atmosphere by a large object or the removal of part of it. Second, a drop in pressure and cooling of the remaining air and surface. This is a mechanism known to occur when pressure drops, the temperature falls, but if there is no air, there is no heat transfer either. Through an atmosphere that is cold but thin, the surface can only lose heat through infrared radiation. And this happens at any pressure, and the heat capacity of soil and water is several orders of magnitude higher than that of thin cold air. The soil will not transfer as much heat to the thin air. The pressure could not have remained low for a long time. In any case, it would have eventually equalized. 2. The release of methane hydrates from the ground and their decomposition. Yes, their reserves are enormous, and when they decompose, energy is absorbed. There's a calculation of the process on a YouTube channel showing how much heat is needed to decompose methane hydrates. As you can see, this hypothesis with methane hydrates is also not viable. What other versions are there? There is another process in which there is a rapid drop in temperature, an endothermic process that occurs when salt water is mixed with fresh water, or vice versa, or when salt dissolves in water. This video clearly demonstrates the process in nature. The phenomenon is called the ice finger of death. Most likely, the saltier water flows into the sea and, being denser, sinks to the bottom, mixing with the fresher water along the way. And this stream freezes because its temperature drops. Probably that's how permafrost was formed. I think the picture was as follows. 
during the process of a geotectonic catastrophe, such as a pole shift or the fall of an asteroid during the times of global extinctions of mammoths and woolly rhinoceroses, and these times could have been quite recent. The main catastrophic factor was the process of water and muddy masses coming out from underground. In many places, the water passed through salt layers, and as we already know, when salt dissolves, its temperature drops. In this case, the water froze almost instantly on the surface. Perhaps in this video we are actually seeing this process? We could confirm this fact by analyzing the ice. If the ice was originally under pressure underground, it couldn't be pushed out. But if water freezes during an endothermic process of dissolving salts in it, then this is quite possible. Moreover, not only table salt or calcium and sodium salts can lower the temperature of water when they dissolve in it, but also saltpeter and nitrate. Ammonia is even stronger than table salt, and there are corresponding calculations for this. This results in five times more energy absorption than during the decomposition of methane hydrates or the melting of ice. Maybe that's exactly how permafrost was formed? It would be interesting to know if anyone has studied the percentage composition of these minerals in permafrost. Is there any data showing that permafrost is salty? Ah, it turns out there is. Here we see the work of scientists titled Cryolithogenesis within the boundaries of the modern and ancient Arctic shelf. The scientists took samples and analyzed the ice of the permafrost. The ice in the pre-Arctic zones, where the permafrost was studied, has salinity just like seawater. Of course, this may indicate that the permafrost is still a product of frozen water from the ocean, which, like a tsunami, swept across part of the continent. This cannot be ruled out either. But this can also support the hypothesis about the mixing of emerging water with salt layers. There is also a phenomenon of rapid freezing of supercooled liquid. That is, in a calm state, water can remain in liquid form at temperatures below zero degrees. But as soon as you stir it, create movement in its layers, it instantly begins to crystallize. There are also many videos on this topic on YouTube. This phenomenon relates to crystallization nuclei. Without impurities in the water, there are no crystallization nuclei to initiate the phase transition process. As soon as a disturbance appears, a particle, an impurity or mechanical impact, from that moment, crystallization begins. And this phenomenon could also have taken place during the formation of permafrost. These processes, which have come to the surface of the water, can be observed in photographs of the permafrost itself. As you can see, the upper soil layers, clay and humus, are located on layers of almost pure ice. That is, a permafrost is not always just frozen soil, it is eternal ice with forest layers lying above it. Where they came from is a separate question. They were even discovered in the Arctic ice and shown to our president, prime minister and other high-ranking officials of the country. Does anyone know where they came from? And in these layers of permafrost they find bones, tusks and even whole carcasses of mammoths, woolly rhinoceroses, reindeer and other representatives of ancient fauna. Most of all, of course, are mammoth bones. Scientists often say that during the glacial epoch, erosion occurred not only due to water erosion, but also because of the mechanical movement of ice. And this process is not understood. Why did the ice sheets move across flat territories? These aren't mountains with slopes. It turns out that this sometimes happens in coastal areas. Let's take a look. This phenomenon is not unique. It happens on the shores of Baikal. I saw a video from Yesk on the shore of the Sea of Azov. I'll suggest this mechanism. Fresh water flows into the sea. It's lighter and rises to the surface, mixing with the salt water. The final mixing process happens at the surface, where it reaches freezing temperatures, and that's when a funnel forms. As the ice spreads from this center, the ice starts moving toward the shore. These are circles on the ice of Baikal, but I don't know how to explain the mechanism in Lake Baikal. Salt water is heavier and does not rise to the surface. It is possible that these ice movements here are connected to large-scale degassing from faults on the bottom of Baikal. During the glaciation periods, a similar process could have occurred at the places where this supercooled salt water emerged, as can be seen with the emergence of ice from the ground. As the ice sheet grew, the ice was pushed apart, shifting its layers into open spaces. And here is another interesting observation. It is known that the water of the Baltic Sea is among the freshest waters in the world's oceans. Quote, the waters of the Baltic Sea contain about 2.8 grams of salt per kilogram, while the waters of the world's oceans on average contain from 35 to 42. 
But the most interesting thing is that since the surface temperature of the sea in summer ranges from 9 to 17 degrees Celsius, when you dive, the temperature slowly decreases. And at a depth of 20 to 40 meters, there is a sudden drop in temperature down to 0.5 degrees Celsius, after which it slowly begins to rise near the bottom, reaching about 5 degrees Celsius. We can already guess how such a low temperature of the thermocline is formed. By mixing fresh water and salt water, most likely there are fresh water springs coming from the bottom of the Baltic Sea. When it mixes with seawater, an endothermic process occurs with a decrease in temperature. But the pressure prevents the water from freezing and the volume of this fresh water is not enough for ice to form. 